What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuff Series. I want to take a look at Tony Canzanieri. I have him ranked number nine, collectively, with the Scotch Wop, Johnny Dundee, as well as the Ghetto Wizard, Benny Leonard. Now, exactly who was Tony Canzanieri? He was born November 6, 1908, in Slendale, Louisiana. He died December 9th, 1959, the Lower East Side of New York. And he stood five foot four inches, weighed 117 to 143 and three quarter pounds. He was managed by Sammy Goldman. Had a record of 137 wins, 24 losses, 10 draws, 44 knockouts, and he'd be involved in four no decision contests. Now, Jewish star Barney Ross had vacated the lightweight championship crown. He wanted to move up to the welterweight division and challenge Jimmy McLaurin, who was known as the Babyface Assassin. Now, Jimmy McLaurin would become the welterweight champion when he would knock out young Corbett III in one round. Young Corbett III with the Southpaw. That was very impressive by Jimmy McLaurin. Well, those few names would be just a handful of fighters that would be in the time of Tony Canzanieri. And Tony Canzanieri would now fight for the vacated crown left over by Barney Ross. And he would have to take on Lou Ambers, Hickamaya Hurricane. And he would do that very thing. And he would defeat him in 15 rounds, 1935. And he would become the lightweight champion of the world. Now, Tony Canzanieri is very underrated. In fact, you hear very little of him. There was a time when he was the top name in all of boxing. Became the World Featherweight Champion, October 24th, 1927, in New York, 15 rounds, over Johnny Dundee, known as the Scotch Wop. The Scotch Wop was born November 22nd, 1893, Sicily, Italy. He died April 22nd, 1965, East Orange, New Jersey. He stood five foot four and a half inches, weighed 105 to 130 pounds, and he was managed by Jimmy Johnston. Jimmy Johnston would run New York's Madison Square Garden. Now, the thing with Jimmy Johnston, Joe Lewis, who would eventually become the heavyweight champion of the world, second ever to do it as a black fighter, in 1937, he would knock out Jimmy Broderick, Chicago Stadium, actually it was one of the most brutal knockouts at that time. Set up well. But Jimmy Johnston did not want any part of Joe Lewis. Mike Jacobs would step in. But Jimmy Johnston would host a tremendous amount of fights at New York's Madison Square Garden. Between 1920 and 1929 would be the reign of this awesome fighter. He would have 90 wins, 31 losses, 19 draws, and 22 knockouts. Had 194 no decisions and one no contest. 1911, he would have 47 bouts. 1919, 25 bouts. Within that time, he would take on Benny Leonard three times, Woody Jackson twice. Jack Bernstein, Vincent Pepper Martin, as well as Charlie Phil Rosenblum, became the world lightweight champion, November 14th, 1930, in New York. We scored a one-round knockout over our singer, Abraham Singer, who was known as the Battling Bronco of the Bronx. He was born September 1st, 1909, in New York. Died April 20th, 1961 in New York as well. And he would die, unfortunately, in having a bar fight. Stood five foot four and a half inches, weighed 123 pounds to 137 pounds. Had 73 total bouts with nine losses. And he would take on great fighters such as Billy Patrol, the Fargo Express. Now, Billy Patrol was one of the most devastating body punches in all of boxing. He would take on fighters such as Bonnie Ross and Bat Battalino and many, many others. Quite a fighter. 
was Billy Patrol, the Fargo Express. Our singer would also be in the ring. With the babyface assassin, Jimmy McLaurin, had his wars with Barney Ross, and as I stated, he would take on a southpaw for the welterweight championship belt. His name was Young Corbett III, but he would be stopped in one round with Young Corbett III. Johnny Dundee is Scotch Wild. What was special about Johnny Dundee? He was a beautiful rope dancer, one of the best in the business. He would hook his bottom foot. Well, I should say he should hook his foot on the bottom rope. He would sit his butt on the middle strand. He only has three strands at that time. And hook his neck on the top strand. And he would straddle, parry, shoulder roll. Spin his man off the ropes. He was a wonderful fighter. Wonderful rope dancer. <laughs> was Johnny Dundee. Well, our singer would also take on Sid Terrace. Sid Terrace would knock out. Ruby Goldstein in one round. The New York Polo Grounds. Heard a lot about him. Sid Terrace, and I was told what a magnificent fighter he was. Spuck Myers, Tony Canzanari himself, Jack Bernstein, very good Jewish fighter, and Jackie Fields, as well as Jack Zivick. Jack Zivick was one of five Zivick brothers. And the Zivick brothers would be the only two fighters out of the five that would be and win a gold medal in the Olympic Games, 1928. Along with the Spinks brothers, Michael and Leon, 1976. But our singer, an outstanding fighter he was. He would win the lightweight championship crown July 17, 1930 over Sammy Mandel in the Bronx, New York. Knocking him out in one round. He would take on Andre Rogers, Sammy Mandel, Pete Zivic, and Pete Nebo. Chick Suggs, Eddie Cannonball Martin, as well as Eddie Mack. Casanova would become the World Junior Welterweight Champion, April 24, 1931, at the Chicago Stadium against champ Jackie Kidberg. Now, Tony Casanova becomes the World Lightweight Champion, World Junior Welterweight Champion, at this time. Jackie Kidberg, who was he? His name was the White Chapel Worldwind, Judas Bergman. He was born June 28, 1909 in London, England. He died April 22, 1991 in London, England. Lived a long time. And he was managed by Harry Levine and trained by Ray Arcel. He had a total ball career of 157 fights, 26 losses, 9 draws, and 57 knockouts. He'd be in the ring with Billy Patrol. He'd knock out and be knocked out by Patrol. And he would win 10 rounds. Mushy Callahan fought him twice, won 10 rounds, and stopped him in 10 rounds. Now, who was Mushy Callahan? I met him personally. He would wind up residing in Las Vegas, Nevada, but he died in Chicago, Illinois. And Mushy Callahan would have some career. Mushy Callahan would lose to Jackie Kidburn for the Junior Welterweight Championship strap. By the way, that title was first established in 1922 by Pinky Mitchell. And you had some wonderful fighters who would carry that legacy. Mushy Callahan was brought over to Hollywood after a long career of fighting, refereeing, and judging. And he was brought over there as a producer for the Western world, teaching fighters how to throw punches correctly and land correctly after a punch was thrown to the chin and body. The stuntman was controlled by Mushy Callahan, as well as the scripts. And as I stated, I have met Mushy Callahan, told me some great stories. Pretty decent humanitarian as far as my intelligence will tell me. But he was a hell of a fighter. Jackie Kidbird would defeat Tippy Larkin. Freddie Redcock Crane. Freddie Redcock Crane would become the welterweight champion when he would defeat 
a fighter by the name of Fitzy Zivic. And he would win in 1941. Pedro Martinez, Aldi Spaulding, Harry Whistler, very good fighters that Jackie Kidbird would be in the ring with. He would be in the Hall of Fame, 1994. He would also take on Sammy Fuller twice and Bruce Flowers twice. Sammy Fuller had defeated young Peter Jackson. He was on the undercard of Corn Griffin and Jim Braddock, as well as Primo Carnera and Max Baer. This fight took place at the New York's Madison Square Garden Bowl. And Tony Canzanari would also face Kid Chocolate, the Cuban Bong Bong, November 20th, 1931 in New York. He would face him at the New York's Madison Square Garden before the World Lightweight and Junior Lightweight Championship of the World. Shout out to Tony Canzanari as we take a look at some of his great moments in the game of boxing. Now we're looking at Sammy Mendel. He won the title July 3rd, 1926. And he would lose it, July 17th, 1930. Sammy Mendel was a cutie pie, but he was a mean fighter. And he would have his hands full with some of the greatest men that fought in his time. Sammy Mendel. Jackie Kidbird from England. He was a sensational fighter. And Jackie Kidbird was trained by Ray Arcel. He'd be an opponent for Tony Cantoneri, as well as Johnny Dundee. Like I said, these men were the best in their time. And Tony Cantoneri, Johnny Dundee, as well as Berlin Lettered, is my number nine ranked greatest fighter of all time. That goes a long way. And it's because of their accomplishments, their achievements, their ability to box and get out of trouble and take on men in their youth and still come out on top. Their longevity all plays a part in that decision. Quite a fighter with Jackie Kidberg. Al Singer. Al Singh was from New York. He held the lightweight championship crown, July 17th, 1930, to November 14th, 1930. Al Singh was very popular during his time. He'd be in the ring with Tony Cantoneri. Very good fighter was Al Singer. Lou Ambers, the Hickamaya Hurricane, held the lightweight championship crown September 3rd, 1936, August 17th, 1938, August 22nd, 1939, and May 10th, 1940. He was some fighter, but he would lose his first time around trying to gain the lightweight championship crown. It was a vacant strap left over by Bonnie Ross. And being there with Tony Canzanari, Canzanari, would give Lou Ambers the business. But Lou Ambers would, once again, get an opportunity at the lightweight championship strap. He would become champion, but he would lose it to Henry Armstrong, 1938. But he would gain it with Henry Armstrong. 
shortly after that. But then he would finally lose it to Lou Jenkins. But Lou Ambers would be in there with Barney Ross and many others. Very good fighter was Lou Ambers. He was an opponent of Tony Canzanieri. Now, Tony Casanari is to your right. He's on the scales with Johnny Dundee. Johnny Dundee is to your left. Tony Casanari would become the featherweight champion of the world. Now, in the middle picture, you see Tony Casanari on the scale. And looking on, and you're right, is a man by the name of P. Saramento. Very good Filipino fighter. Very underrated. Most don't know who he is. A lot of men didn't want to face P. Saramento. Very tricky. Seemed like all the Filipinos coming up. Little Flash Alorte. Of course, Manny Pacquiao. P. Saramento. All southpaws. But they go all fight. And a picture all the way to your right. Tony Canzanieri, standing with his arms folded to your left, on a scale with Sammy Mandel. This was a great time in boxing. Tony Canzanieri had ruled the game in the low weight divisions. I want to send a special shout out to Tony Canzanieri. As I stated, I have him ranked number nine collectively with Benny Leonard. And Johnny Dundee. I'm Scrapbook Boxing. Museum of the Forgotten Fist of Series. All great fights and all great fighters. Would never be forgotten on my channel. Let's take a look. A few clips of the great Tony Canzanieri. Now, as we look at Tony Canzanieri, a phenomenal fighter he was. And like I said, he's very underrated. But Tony Canzanieri had all the skills and techniques of his time. We're going to see a few of these techniques in some of the clips that we're going to be watching right now. Now, he's going to be in the ring with Jackie Kidbird. I want you to take a look at Tony Canzanieri. Canzanieri right now is to your right. He's now to the he's he's to the right. He has his back to you at this moment. Now he's to the left. And he's in there with Jackie Kidbird. Look at the combinations that Tony Canzanieri is throwing. Now remember, we're in the 1920s, 30s. And he had fast hands. I would have loved to have seen Tony Canzanieri in the ring with Willie Pep. That would have been something to see. Look at the double jabs, jab to the body. He throws up a cut. He shouldn't throw from the outside, but he was fast enough to get away with it. He would come back with his own hooks. Had his hands down, but he would stand right in front of you and move from side to side. Look at the combinations. And he's throwing punches in the right places. Oh, a beautiful hook to the head of Jackie Kidberg. Oh, beautiful one-two combination. And he lifts the title from Jackie Kidberg. Oh, look at the inside body work of Tony Canzanieri. He was a complete fighter during his years. That's how he was able to take the Cuban bong bong Kid Chocolate. Didn't quite take him to school. But he gave Kid Chocolate an opportunity to go back to the drawing board. He would fight Chocolate once again. And Tony Canzanieri. Oh, beautiful well-timed punch. Shook his man up. 
And this is the problem that Tony Canzanetti would give the average opponents that he would face. Look at the defensive skills of Tony Canzanetti. What a fighter. Very underrated this man was. Oh, beautiful jab. Look at the defensive skills of Tony Canzanero. He has his hands raised once again. Now he's in there with the Cuban bong bong, Kid Chocolate. Kid Chocolate is to your right. Tony Canzanero is to the left. Stabs Kid Chocolate with the left jab to the stomach. He's very elusive in there. But look at the skill set of Kid Chocolate. Kid Chocolate is just a little green for Tony Canzanero. Oh, good jab by Tony Canzanero. And see, the issue is, a lot of the fighters who were denied opportunities didn't get the opportunities to get the experience they needed with some of the elite fighters. So when they were given an opportunity for the elite fighters, they wasn't quite prepared. And that's the problem. Oh, but look at the movement of Tony Canzanero. And look at the fast hands and movement of Kid Chocolate. Two well school fighters. Two well school fighters. Now, of course, the film is sped up a little bit during that time. But you can see the skill set. Oh. Kid Chocolate had a phenomenal amateur career in Cuba. Over 100 undefeated fights. Oh, look at Tony Canzanari. Oh, very, very good fights. He's in there right now with Barney Ross. Barney Ross would become the welterweight champion of the world. He would give up his lightweight title. So he can move up to take on Jimmy McLaurin, babyface assassin. And that's when Tony Canzanari would face Lou Ambers, Hickelmeyer Hurricane, with a vacant strap in a lightweight division. Now, oh, look at the fast jabs of Tony Canzanari. Phenomenal fighter he was. Tony Canzanari has white stripe. And he's to your left. Oh. Oh, beautiful, beautiful pull encounter. And that was a very nice straight right hand thrown. Look at Tony Canzanari. Bounce off the ropes. Comes back with combinations on Barney Ross. Hall of Famer. Nice jab by Tony Canzanari. Oh, a beautiful right hand drop by Tony Canzanari. Oh, another one. Oh, very good fight. Now, this next and last fight I'm going to show you is with Tony Canzanari and Lou Ambers. Now, Lou Ambers is to the right right now. Tony Canzanari is to your left. And Tony Canzanari is facing Lou Ambers for the vacant lightweight championship strap. That was vacated by Barney Ross. Man, you just saw him in there with. One thing I always told you in all the videos that you would hear me speak on, the jab is the potent weapon. You have to have a beautiful jab to be in there with certain fighters. You cannot not have a jab with certain fighters. And if you want to be a very good fighter, 
you have to have a very good jab. And it's just not poking it out there. It's IQ behind it. You have to know when to throw the jab, how to throw the jab, when to set a man up behind the jab, or when to set a man up to land the jab. Jab has to go up and down, to the head, to the body, to the shoulders, to the neck, to the nose, to the eyes. Oh, beautiful, beautiful punch thrown by Tony Canzanari. He caught Lou Ambers on the turn. And he's like a man at all. He stands right in front of you with his hands down. Setting you up for a shot. I'm Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fist of Gulf Series. All great fights and all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Shout out to Tony Canzanari. One of the greatest fighters of all times. Thanks for watching. Let's continue to watch one more, more, uh, one more moment. Right now, we're looking at Tony Canzanari with Lou Ambers. And this fight is about to end, but we're going to look at a beating, a well school beating from Tony Canzanari to a great Jimmy McLaurin. Jimmy McLaurin was coming up in the game. Now, you have Jimmy McLaurin. He has his back to you right now. That's Jimmy McLaurin facing you. And Tony Canzanari taking him to school. Now he's setting Jim McLaurin up for a shot. So he's baiting him in as Roberto Duran would do with Davey Moore in New York's Madison Square Garden. Oh, beautiful right hand thrown by Tony Canzanari, who's on your left. Oh. And you can see the technique of Jim McLaurin, but he's hurt right now. Got caught with a shot. Ah, oh, beautiful straight right hand to the chin. And Tony Canzanari opens up on him. Now you're looking at an advanced age Tony Canzanari. And a very young Jim McLaurin. Look at the combinations thrown by Tony Canzanari. That's why it's important to know who the fighter was in there with when you want to call him a great fighter. The opponents he fought, the time in which he came. Scrapbook boxing. Salute to Tony Canzanelli.